Hey y'all, it's Dave and just a real long video. <laughs> I know I always say really quick, but then they end up really being long and I know this one's gonna be long. And so this video is going to be part two, a video I did a couple weeks ago on does God still speak today? Let's ask him. And so if you have not seen that and you're watching this, I will put the link in the description and please watch that before you watch this so you have a better understanding of my values as it pertains to this topic and what different groups think of the voice of the Lord, how they handle it and mishandle it. And so anyway, please watch that. This video is part two and is actually built upon that because I've been getting so many emails from that video. Good emails, very thoughtful questions because I've been getting so many emails and I've been writing big, long individual emails for each one. I wanted to address the common questions because most people are asking the same questions. And the first one is just kind of an observation where they're like, oh, I didn't know you were a charismatic guy. You've been following you this whole time. I love that. And so I'm, I'm glad that I kind of snuck up upon you because I do want to keep the language of my channel unifying, even though I am a charismatic. I love my reformed brothers. I love my high church brothers. I have some high church background. I have charismatic background, conservative background, and I love all you guys. And there's so many people within those contexts that genuinely love Jesus and want to know the Lord. And so yes, uh, <laughs> I am a charismatic. I'm more of a Wesleyan thinker and I don't get into on purpose the whole Calvin versus Wesley debate on my channel. I have some very strong opinions and some things to say about that more pointedly when I'm one-on-one -on -one with people. But again, just uh, I think there's better guys that do a more responsible job with that topic than I ever could on this channel or at, at least for now. And so it's something that I've studied and I'm just with a clear conscience, this is where I land. And so even in discussing these things with other brothers, and I'll engage online to a degree, but uh, my my approach in discussing with other brothers is, look, look, I'm searching for truth. We're all searching for truth. We want to know the truth. And so based on scripture, here's what I believe. This is why. And so it's all open-handed. If I'm wrong, change my mind according to the word. Enough on that, but uh, they people find out I'm a Wesleyan charismatic and they're like, oh my gosh, we had no clue. And so anyway, thank you for sticking around <laughs> and uh, and loving me anyway. I love you guys. And so I, I, I really do enjoy the discussion, even though I think there's serious matters to talk about. I, again, I want to keep the language of this channel unifying and be a channel that builds bridges at the same time being able to talk about sober, weighty things. And so anyway, that's usually the first response and many of the emails that I've been getting since I did that video is like, you're a charismatic? What? I'm like, yeah. And so my response to that shock is there's so many videos out about different charismatic groups, about the new apostolic reformation. It's funny, I've been a charismatic for a while and I still have no clue like who this new apostolic reformation is. It's like the boogeyman word for all those charismatic people. Anyway, I just, in, in all honesty, I, I think I know where that understanding comes from, but I think it comes within the charismatic community. We actually really do lack governmental accountability because we have so many independent streams that are completely disconnected from each other and there's hardly any accountability and so that's why you have people saying stupid things and goofy things and so just one of my critiques to people outside the charismatic community is please I beg you don't lump us all together there are leaders in the leaders that are considered charismatic or new apostolic reformation and uh, they just lump us all together as one people find out like oh that guy's a charismatic then he must be just like this guy and like i'm telling you there's people within our movement they would never be welcome in our midst in the church and the congregation that the lord has trusted me with their thoughts and ideas aren't even welcome in my midst and we preach hard against some of those things to kind of be a sober voice in the midst of the charismatic community, even though I believe in the charismatic expression in the pure sense of the word, not what it's been turned into in, in many places. And so anyway, that's just my appeal when people find out they're like, wow, you're kind of 
like a different charismatic. I thought they were all like this and we're not all like this, that, and that. Again, we have so many independent streams that are disconnected and so the heart to actually raise up government within our independent streams to be able to uh, refine our teaching, provide greater accountability for the greater char charismatic body. There is a, a movement within our movement to pull us back to the scriptures and be able to, in a biblical way, have a leadership structure that holds leaders to account more than just the board that they sit on, but actually a community of accountability, of love, and anyway, so that's just my appeal to the charismatic Thing. And then again, the outsiders, please, I beg you, don't lump us together. Then the next questions are usually like, how does God speak? And again, why does he speak? I spoke about that just a little bit at the end of the video of why does he still speak today? Why does he still need to speak? If the scripture's closed and, and already written, why does he still need to continue to speak? Um, how does he do that? All, all the questions around the same genre. So I'm just going to speak to that for a little bit. But before I do, the foundation I believe that needs to be laid before we can go forward and talk about how the Lord speaks, why he speaks, is to actually recognize the damage that Greek philosophy has done to Christianity since the early church. Before Jesus came on the scene, Platonism was already becoming very prevalent even within the Roman Empire. In the Gospels, when you read about the Hellenistic Jews, those were the Jews that actually still held to Judaism, but then adopted the philosophies of Plato, which the foundation of his whole philosophy is the separation of heaven and earth and that the two can never intermingle, the two can never be one. Heaven is everything that's pure and lovely, right, beautiful light. The earth and this flesh stuff, it's always corrupt, it's always evil, and it can never intermingle with heaven or inherit anything of heaven. So this thought was beginning to permeate even in the Jewish culture, this philosophy of the two realms will never mix. So think of the power now of Jesus' message when he comes at the beginning of his ministry teaching and preaching in the synagogues, healing the sick, and his message was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of heaven is near you, it's in your midst, it's inside of you. He used all those phrases. The kingdom of heaven is here, it's at hand. You can reach out, touch it, and interact with it. The kingdom of heaven is here. And so he's telling them to change the way they think. I think re repentance is obviously you turn your back towards sin and the things that have disconnected you from God. So there is a repentance of sin and lifestyles and stuff, but also I believe he was speaking to that mindset of repent from that type of thinking, because heaven's not just like this out here somewhere thing, but it's right here with you in your midst, inside you. And so that it's an important foundation to recognize because what that thought does is as we've disconnected heaven and earth, which is unbiblical. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, Paul says the mystery of God's will is to bring everything in heaven and everything in earth together as one in Christ. And so he's doing that. Jesus gets what he paid for. And so that's one of those realities that's going to happen. The heavens and the earth are going to be as one again in Christ as it was before the fall. So what happened even through the time of Jesus and the early church starting up, there was a guy named Origen, who was a Greek philosopher who gave his life to Christ and became a, a Christian. And he never let go of his Greek philosophy, although he became a Christian. And uh, you know, only God knows his heart, but he thought it was his mission to combine Christianity with Platonic thought. Because this foundation of the separation of heaven and earth, he thought Platoism provided the correct foundations for biblical interpretation. So it was his life mission to combine the philosophies of Plato with Christianity. And what's astonishing is you see some of these commentaries and we still have academic guys that quote and praise this guy Origen um, for bringing the Greek philosophy into our midst. But here's the damage that it, it's done throughout the ages is we have so many systematic theologies that are based on that philosophy of thought and even systematic theologies that say you know they're purely from the bible they'll still many guys will quote this guy Origen, who had a major impact on the way christians think and 
as we separate heaven and earth, what we've also done in our mind is separate our spirit from our body. So supposedly while our spirit is clean and, and all this stuff, we can continue to sin and word, thought, and deed every day and never grow in practical holiness. When Romans 8 clearly says, if you set your mind on things of the spirit, the spirit will actually cause life to dwell in your mortal body. And a lot of charismatic sees on that scripture and say it's only healing. But healing, physical healing, is the byproduct of practical holiness and righteousness permeating your life as you set your mind on things above where Christ is. And so we've created these unbiblical divisions of heaven and earth because of that Greek Platonic thought. One of the byproducts of that is we've made unbiblical divisions between body, soul, and spirit and made them so separate that it's like one's not accountable to the other. First Corinthians chapter two would blow that thought out of the water. Anyway, th this is important to realize as we're going to talk about the voice of the Lord just briefly, and I'm trying to make this as brief as I can, but because of these divisions that we've made in separating body, soul, and spirit, and not understanding how we actually do function as one complete being, we miss the communications of heaven because we're not spiritual people, we're natural people. So that's kind of the, the foundation of we need to recognize the damage of that, and if that kind of throws you off guard, then I would just challenge you to study it. Go look up this guy, or Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N, and, uh, and how Greek philosophy and Platonic thought has influenced the church since its birth. That is the enemy, and what it's done all these couple thousand years later is disconnect us from being able to be a spiritual people that can really commune with the Lord. It's important that we get into that because Hebrews, at the end of chapter 5, it says that mature Christians, mature followers of Jesus, are the ones who have their senses trained to discern. And so if we've divorced our spirit, soul, and our body and think that, you know, they're incompatible or completely separate without looking at the picture of the whole man, that phrase from Hebrews, have your senses trained to discern, doesn't even make any sense. Because he's not talking about your physical senses to discern good and evil. He's talking about your soul. He's talking about your spirit. And through eating and digesting the meat of the word is how he's, the writer of Hebrews says that your senses are trained to discern. And so tearing down that Greek philosophical mindset or that uh, Platonic mindset of heaven and earth are always separate, can never intermingle, your body and your spirit are two just diametrically opposed parts of you, I would highly disagree with. And there's ways to discipline your body to discern the spirit realm. That's why I can't remember if it was in the last video, but this is why when New Agers or witches or Buddhists say things like, there's many ways to God. And I agree with them on the front end because what they're talking about is there's many ways into the spirit realm. And there is, but Jesus said he is the door and it's only by him that we come in rightly. There are people that come in that do not use the door to the spirit realm and Jesus calls them thieves and robbers if they do not go in through that door. And so all throughout history, I mean, it's been proven that men have found ways to discipline their bodies, to train their spiritual senses into what they thought was truth. And then if I can re-emphasize for the Christian life, so many other uh, meditation techniques are focused on emptying your mind when the biblical meditation is filling your mind. And so that's the eating the meat of the word, letting it digest over years dialoguing with God over the word and prayer and falling in love with the Lord in his word, eating the meat of the word, digesting it, and your senses become trained to discern your spiritual sight, intuition, your spiritual hearing. That's why we have to lay this foundation because you start talking about God speaks today and many people, they, they just have no grid for it because so many are still locked into the influence of Platonic thinking and what Origen did to combine Greek philosophy with Christianity and the effects of that still today. And so again, your, your body is more one than you realize. Heaven and earth, the spiritual realm, is more one than we realize. And it's not what the Greek philosophers and it's not what Origen and Plato and Aristotle say it is. The Bible is very clear on the spiritual realm. It's very clear on the kingdom of heaven. 
and this natural realm and that Jesus is king of it all and it's all coming together as one in him. Oh my goodness, hallelujah. Moving on and answering the question, why does he speak today if he's not writing the Bible? If I can just lead off with the scripture, John 17, 3, Jesus is praying and he's talking to the Father and he says that this is eternal life, that they would know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent, that they would know you. And so the purpose for the Lord speaking today is not for some new revelation, new way to heaven, to add more books to the Bible, but it's building a personal relationship that you would experience eternal life. Because eternal life for me is for me to know him, and that's not eternal life for you. Eternal life for you is for you to know him. And again, that comes through building relationship with him on the basis of his word. If you're not rooted and grounded on his word, that's dangerous, and I covered that in the first video. First and foremost, the reason he speaks is for eternal life, for the knowledge of God to continue to grow in you, left brain and right brain, intellectually, relationally, and emotionally. All those things being brought together as one. He's the Lord of the left brain and the right brain. He created them both, and he created them both to be able to have the faculties to learn about him and know him on a personal level. Proverbs in chapter 4, it says that knowledge and understanding come from his mouth. So that's a part of the personal relationship as we fill ourselves with the language of heaven, the Bible. The first reason why is it's just relationship, eternal life. The second reason why is from the outflow of building that relationship, circumstantial direction in the moment things that aren't in the Bible. And I'll give you a, a sobering thought because we don't think about this mostly in overseas or other cultures, past, present, and the absolute dependency on hearing the voice of the Lord that many people throughout history and on the globe currently live in. And so there's uh, some friends of ours that live, well, I probably shouldn't say where they live, but they've are in the Middle East and they're still seeing great conflict where they're at and for many many years now I mean bombs, suicide bombs, stabbing, just, you, you know what's going on over there and so they live in the context of that and they felt very specific that they were not supposed to flee from it but they were supposed to be a light to the others in the Muslim community that were also victims of this and so these people no kidding have early morning prayer meetings at their house for their neighborhood every morning at 6 a.m. for several hours to seek the Lord, to worship Him, and in the context of that, get direction for that day. Because there's food shortages, where to go specifically for food, and not just that food would be there, but that you wouldn't get bombed on the way, or kidnapped, or something on the way. Or should we send our kids to school today, because is a suicide bomber going to blow us up on the way to the school on this route, or I mean even which route should we take? So no kidding, it's a matter of life and death, and they have had their senses trained to discern the voice of the Lord even in the midst of all that, and it is a life and death situation for them and their family. But what's really cool is their Muslim neighbors have been taking notice of this, and they actually come to these prayer meetings to seek the God of Jacob on whether or not they should send their kids to school or what route they should go and all that stuff. And so they are shining the light of the knowledge of Jesus even in the midst of all that. I could go on an example after example of like that where people are really dependent. For us over here, we have so much academic stuff, which I love the academic stuff, don't get me wrong, but we have such a Western academic, just ivory tower position within many of our circles and much of our thinking that, you know, we hear about the voice of the Lord and it's just, a, a debatable option. You know, I, I can take that or leave that. And beloved, like over there, it's not a debatable option. You are dependent and you survive on having your senses trained and eating the meat of the word. And so that's the second reason why. So relationships and circumstantial direction, which might sound cheesy here in the Western context, but again, there's places throughout history and even now that is a big deal. And we're not talking about you know, new religions, new books to the Bible, but do I send my kids to school today because are they going to get bombed at school? And so there's some other really good questions I just wanted to hit briefly. And again, I apologize for the length of this video. Maybe put, put pause, get some popcorn and come back. The next question I want to hit is how does God speak today? And so like, is it a voice? Do you walk around hearing this voice? Or is it the still small voice, the whisper? What is it? How does he speak? And so 
I believe he speaks in many different ways. And so it might just be lighting your affections on fire as you read the word, as you pray, directing your thoughts according to scripture, which I have found just for me personally, that's one of his favorite methods. That's one of the reasons I just, I love the Bible and I can't get enough of it in me. Just memorized in my heart, treasured in my heart that I can keep pressing on and growing in my relationship and my knowledge and understanding of who he is and my love for him. And uh, the biggest part of that is filling your heart and mind with scripture so that he can direct your thoughts according to scripture and even give you circumstantial dictates through scripture. He, he loves his word. He absolutely loves his word. And so I believe he can speak through many just kind of things like we would even call coincidences. But there is one way I've noticed since I've become a Christian that I've been able to hear and understand his voice. And this is why I believe it's so important to go after the damage that Platonism has done because it, there really is a training your senses to discern. And so if the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you and he is a spirit, God is spirit, and he's speaking and communing with you through your spirit, when your spirit gives your mind the communication, your spirit's almost like the, the middleman between that and gives your mind the communication, it sounds like your own thoughts. And there's subtle differences that I've, I've noticed where he's a much higher processor than me. And so sometimes it'll just be a thought, bam, just comes into my mind. And I'm just like, whoa, I gotta kind of back up and, and sort through that. And then at the same time, be careful not to add or take away anything that he's speaking to me. I believe Paul talks about this very dynamic at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I wanted to share just a quick story. Um, how many of you know who Charlton Heston is? If you don't, he was the actor who played in the old Ben-Hur movie. He was also Moses in the Ten Commandments movie. He was known for being a Christian, a lover of Jesus, and so he's playing Moses, has the lead role in Ten Commandments. He goes to the casting crew and, and the directors and producers and stuff, and he begins to let them know he wants to try out for the part of God because he thinks it would be appropriate for him to play God if he's playing Moses. <laughs> and so they thought he was conceited. Like, wow, all this success is getting to your head. You're already, you already have the lead role and now you want to be God too? But what he told him was profound. He's like, no, because if genuine Christians watch this and God's voice is a different voice than mine, it won't make sense to them because God doesn't speak like that. Because when God speaks, it actually kind of sounds like your own voice. And so they bought it and Charlton Heston is the voice of God. But they did slow it down, so when he's at the burning bush, instead of his regular voice, he says, Moses. I love that story about him, because uh, this idea and this thinking, it isn't a, a strange, weird thing. It's not, it doesn't have to be classified as New Age or, or, or anything. Like, God created us for communion with him, and the devil has forerun so many important aspects of God and the call of the Christian life and made it weird that we're afraid to touch topics like this. And for instance, just another topic, if I say I have a lot to say about Melchizedek, instantly people would draw back and think, oh man, that's New Age because New Agers have abused uh, the Melchizedek language. Uh, Mormons have abused the Melchizedek language and, and, and others as well. And so if we pull out this important figure who Jesus is a high priest according to the order of and actually point you to Hebrews has a lot to say. Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews says, we have a lot to say about Melchizedek, but you can't hear it right now because you've become dull of hearing because you're not eating the meat of the word. Your senses are not trained. And so I would submit we have a lot to say about these things, but I feel like this is so much just introductory stuff and we even have to be careful with our language because if we just come out swinging, then people tend to draw back like the Melchizedek thing and so I just ask you to search the scriptures pray journal with the Lord um, I think the devil again has just forerun some stuff and twisting truth and twisting knowledge and giving people access into the spiritual realm as a thief and a robber but I believe with all my heart Christians should be those that 
not just know how to access the spirit realm, but be able to draw near to God in the Holy of Holies. We've been given access to that place by the blood of Jesus. And the repeated call of Hebrews is draw near with a sincere heart full of faith. Draw near and don't neglect the assembling of yourselves, that royal priesthood being built together to offer up spiritual sacrifice to the Lord, that thanksgiving would be on your lips. Oh my goodness. Anyway, I believe this is one of our high callings and this is eternal life, that people, that we would know you, that I would know him, that you would know him. And instead of drawing back because information might be weird because someone else has abused it historically or someone else is abusing another aspect of it now, is truth doesn't care about your opinions. Truth is truth. So it's the same thing. If he's really made this to be a true thing, if there are twisted misrepresentations of what the Lord's trying to bring his people into, why would we neglect that because someone else has abused it but be able to see it in truth speak it in truth grow and mature in those areas in truth as again we grow on his word I gotta keep emphasizing that point because you cannot do this without the Word of God coming back to how he speaks and talking about just that still small voice that's in your spirit as he begins to speak things to your spirit that come up in your mind that it sounds like your voice. We're constantly surrounded by spiritual activity, whether it's demons on assignment, angels, your own thoughts, and then the Holy Spirit. And so Paul, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is talking about the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God to reveal them to spiritual men. And that spiritual men are those who can judge and appraise all things and is judged by no one. And so I believe one of the dynamics of being able to judge all things is to be able to pick up on the spiritual activity. And demons are sneaky too and they start planning thoughts in your head and, and planning temptation in there. Being able to recognize your own fleshly desires and bents and recognize your own thoughts, recognize a demon trying to plant temptation. And I just caution people on angelic activity and, and wanting to run around talking to angels. That's dangerous stuff. Samson's dad had an encounter with an angel that came to announce Samson's birth and Samson tried to get a little bit too close to the angel and the angel actually re rebuked him when Samson wanted to know the angel's name. Like, why do you want to know my name, seeing that it's beautiful? And so, anyway, be careful with the angelic stuff, but then you've got the voice of the Holy Spirit living in you and guiding you and communing with you. And so, the spiritual person is the one who has his senses trained through eating the meat of the Word, can understand what's going on around them, discern all things, and lock in on the important voice of the Holy Spirit and allow him to speak in your life. Most of the time, he just directs my thoughts according to scripture. I love that, but I do believe that I hear his voice. And most of the time when I hear it, it's really just the warmings of the heart with maybe a I love you or thank you and him telling me thank you and, and him just washing me with, with his word. And we think on the surface like, well, those are simple weird little things, but you have no idea. Like when you are close to God, the creator of the universe, and he says, I love you back, that is a huge revelation. That is amazing. That should sustain every one of us. And all of the other depth in the word is just a byproduct of that love relationship. That is the main thing. And so another question in talking about this, the voice of the Lord that I get is, how do you genuinely know that it's him? And this is one that's a little bit difficult to substantiate because this is something the ind individuals have to walk through for themselves in coming to really know that they know the voice of the Lord. I'll say that scripture is the plumb line. And if you think you're hearing something that is a complete contradictory or even just a little twisting of scripture. I had a pastor call me a while back and he was very excited about this quote, Rhema word from the Lord. And what he did was he took a chapter in Isaiah and took a scripture from the beginning of the chapter, the middle, and the end of the chapter, flip-flopped them all to say the Lord is gave me this rhema word. And so it's like just because you received a word from the Lord doesn't give you permission to twist scriptures. If you have to do anything like that to rework the word that he's written, <laughs> just listener beware listener beware that's like red alert stuff he loves his word and he's not going to come and twist it twisted is wicked and there's one whose goal is to twist 
and to contort and it is not the Holy Spirit he will not do that and so one of the ways I genuinely know it's him is I always use a hundred percent of the time the filter of scripture is what I'm hearing scriptural and if he shows up and says I love you yeah <laughs> that's scriptural but uh, at, at the beginning he would prompt me with small things like when I would I had been saved a couple months and my wife and I had our first fight since I had been saved and so my prayer was, God, you need to show her because I know I'm right <laughs> and you just need to show her and open her eyes. And he interrupted me and said, David, apologize to your wife. <laughs> Ouch. I, di I didn't want to do that. And so this is not my own thought. This is not my own bent. I'm here praying, change my wife. I'm right. She's wrong. And he interrupts me to interject his thoughts and his heart of apologize to your wife and so I did so it was just little things like that that begin to build my faith to the point where now even just in the last few months he's called me and the leadership team at SA Tabernacle here locally to actually make a move that was over 12 times our budget and over three times of what we were currently bringing in a month and we made the move anyway trusting I believe you Lord but before there's years of building history in the word of hearing his voice of doing the little things of apologize to your wife and and many things like that some big things some small things but just a history of building faith of those things actually working out and so even just this last February we made the move the Lord's paying for everything and still continuing to grow the ministry and so just situations like that it's like you look back and like wow that was the Lord and just thank you Lord for your guidance and I pray that I'd be sensitive as he continues to guide and speak to us the little things the big things all the things I want to hear his voice and so that I can't uh, really substantiate it according to scripture of how do I genuinely know it's him because that's so individualized that you just have to build the history on your own of knowing it's him and going through just obeying him whatever he says do it if it's according to his word it will change your life my goodness it will change your life and so I can genuinely point to with a clear conscience in scripture that yes, God speaks today and he loves to speak today. This is why he speaks today is for relationship, for situational direction, for yourself or other members of the body of Christ or in evangelism. I think this, that's one of the things we need to combine academic apologetics with that kind of apologetics as well where we're able to speak the wisdom of the word at the same time be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what is he saying and do we need to pray for a particular thing for that individual or is he breathing on a particular scripture that might not be a part of our normal presentation and so anyway I would love to see the combination of those two in the apologetic realm anyway again just the personal how do you know it's him I have a history of hearing him that has just built my faith with example after example like I just shared. And so the final thing I wanted to hit was the quote is from John Owen who is a uh, wonderful Puritan thinker and just because I'm a Wesleyan doesn't mean I can't appreciate the Puritans. I've got all kinds of stuff. I've got The Existence and Attributes of God by Stephen Charnock, Looking at a Jesus by Isaac Ambrose, Alarm to the Unconverted by Joseph Alline, The Life of God and the Soul of Man by, um, man I can't remember who wrote. Uh, the life of God and the soul of man and you know I, I could just go on I've got volumes of Spurgeon and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones so I love the reformers and I I love to read those guys and so this isn't a, a, a dogging on them but this is just my thoughts in response to this John Owen quote which uh, many of you uh, might be familiar with this quote by him if private revelations agree with scripture they are needless and if they disagree they are false. Looking at that statement, and I just want to talk about the last part first because that's easy. I agree with that. If private revelations disagree with scripture, they are false. And I think I spoke to that clearly earlier in the video anyways. But the beginning of it could be taken two ways in my mind and it all depends on what John Owen meant by revelation. So one of you guys that has that book where that quote came from, if you could leave a comment on and give us the full context of what he actually means by private revelations because if he's talking about 
Joseph Smith style private revelations or Mohammed style private revelations, then I would agree with that. And as far as just like this new revelation that doesn't have any historical or scriptural backing, it's like God's saying this new thing, now let's go in this new direction like a Joseph Smith or a Mohammed, I, I, then I would completely agree with that whole statement if that's what he's talking about, about these private revelations being a new thing. But if he doesn't mean that and he actually means what I've been talking about in this whole video, it seems like he's taking the eternal life part of the equation, which is to know God, out of the Christian life. And so I've, I would be surprised to see a Puritan do that because most of those guys wrote about eternal life in such wonderful ways that I would be surprised if that's what he meant, but just seemingly on the surface that quote seems to strip us from the things like the warmings on the heart or having the Holy Spirit speak to you on a relational level. Again, not a, a new revelation, but at the same time there are things hidden that are truth and always have been in truth are going to be found in scripture when the Lord just flips the switch. How many times were we told in prophets uh, like Daniel or Revelation, like these things are sealed or, I, I mean, there's gonna be a generation that gets to know what those seven thunders are that are thundered out in the book of Revelation. Those are sealed up. And I don't want to presume to know, like I've got this private revelation of what the seven thunders are, but the fact of the matter is, that's a truth that's there, but it's sealed, and the Lord has sealed it up and set it apart for an appointed time, and there's gonna be a generation that knows what the seven thunders are. Jesus talks to another church, and he says, if you overcome, I will show you the hidden manna. And so the revelation that has been hidden from your eyes, though it might be new to you and light your heart up, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a new revelation in the aspect of a Joseph Smith leading people off into a new completely contradictory thing. It's not necessarily that it's the new information, but it's those things that have been hidden that are being revealed. So I don't think anyone that <laughs> would claim that they know the whole brevity of scripture. So as you spend time with the hidden things that were previously not known to your intellect and to your heart become a revelation for you. But again, to bring it back to the personal relationship and the Lord speaking to you relationally, um, situationally, like my friends from the Middle East that I shared with you, maybe you guys go quote that John Owen to them and see what they say. <laughs> and let them tell you if the voice of the Lord and, and those daily revelations in their life is not needed. I think it's a much needed aspect because how do you get to experience eternal life? John 17, 3, eternal life without getting to know someone on a personal level. And just lastly on this issue, if I can put John Owen's quote next to Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesians chapter one, listen to this. Ephesians chapter one, I'm gonna start in verse 16 and then read a couple verses. Paul says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. Paul's praying that our spiritual senses would be opened, our eyes enlightened, the eyes of our heart being enlightened, not these eyes, the eyes of our heart, that we would have a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ. And so again, I know there's many great men that have written a lot of great things and I know John Owen's written amazing stuff too, but again, we are but mere men, we are dust and all flesh is grass that fades away, Isaiah 40. And so anytime we hear anyone speak or like these quotes that have been around for a while, like put them up to scripture. I'm not gonna pick it apart, but you just put those quotes up side by side and, and see, what, see what you think and what's the Lord saying in his word to us. Thanks for watching this video if you stuck here this long, my goodness. And then, uh, so since it's so long, I won't mention the audio Bible and my music that's available at forloveoftheboard.bandcamp.com or that I have a Patreon page that you can support me on if you like the work of this channel for as little as $2 a month. So I, I won't mention that since it's been so long. But I will put the links in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.